Iron Man 3 was a lot, and I really like it. Probably my least favorite Iron Man movie, though. Iron Man 1 is a masterpiece, and I know it's the bad one, but I love watching Iron Man 2, mostly because of this guy. But Iron Man 3 holds up. The returning crew was great, as always. There are a bunch of unusual and fun action scenes, and whether you agree with what ultimately happened to the character or not, Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin was thoroughly entertaining. However, I'm not a huge fan of the finale, the big fight on the port. It's Tony and Rhodes and Pepper and 35 Iron Man suits versus Aldrich Killian and 20 or so extremist soldiers. It's very busy, superhero sensory overload. The equivalent of being right in the middle of three bands you really like playing at the same time. You know cool stuff is happening, but since it's all happening at once, you don't really get to enjoy it. But I don't think it needed to be like that. Iron Man 3 could have taken more time to build up to the finale. In fact, I think it could change one scene much earlier in the movie that makes the overall film more consistent and the finale far more effective. And that change is, Tony's mansion shouldn't be attacked by a couple of helicopters. It should be attacked by this guy, Saban. I really don't understand the helicopter attack scene. But let's get this out of the way. The premise for the scene is preposterous. I'm sure there are more than a couple of what's wrong with the helicopter scene videos, but man, this makes so little sense. A group of terrorists shoot a missile at Tony's house. Tony doesn't notice. Pepper doesn't notice. Jarvis doesn't notice. It doesn't trip any alarms or sensors. The only person that sees the missile is Maya, who catches it on TV because the breaking news has a live shot of someone shooting a missile at the mansion which would be the most amazing breaking news scoop of all time. And why is this specific moment on TV? Is there video of Tony's house playing nonstop just in case of a surprise terrorist attack? Did news people have time to call their control room and say, guys, someone just shot a missile at Tony's Malibu mansion, put it on TV. Saying that sentence probably takes more time than it takes for the missile to reach the mansion. But besides all the logical nonsense, this scene is also a wasted story opportunity. The only important story goals that this scene accomplishes are proving that the Mandarin is a serious threat and destroying Tony's mansion for force him to escape to Tennessee. And yeah, those are things that the movie needs to do at that moment, but that can't be all this scene is for. Especially considering there are some pretty important things that Iron Man 3 never does, which would fit really well here. So we're going to walk through this alternate version of the mansion attack, and hopefully when we're done, we'll have a fun scene with some great character moments that sets up a more complete ending. So let's start the scene the same way. Pepper and Tony are fighting because this is an Iron Man movie. Maya Hansen enters the house with some information for Tony. Her presence only further annoys Pepper, which exacerbates the argument and just as Pepper is about to leave, ding dong, the doorbell rings. Tony checks his monitors and sees Saban, or Savin, I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce this guy's name. We're going with Savin. Outside the mansion, maybe Savin can even wave at the cameras. After all, Tony gave the Mandarin his home address. It would be a lot more fun if Savin shows up casually, not as part of a sneak attack. He walks right up to the front door. And hey, Maya was able to walk in, so what's stopping Savin from doing the same thing? Once Tony does some facial recognition and realizes that Savin was connected to the explosion that put Happy in a coma, Tony activates some of the countermeasures he's been working on and goes outside to meet Saban. Because it's weird that Tony spends the first half hour of the movie acting like a paranoid nutcase, but after Tony challenges the Mandarin to a fight at his house, Tony is caught completely off guard when the Mandarin's dudes go to his house. Sure, Pepper makes it clear that Tony's overdoing it with the suits, but Tony is good at what he does. Tony should have some serious defenses in place. The helicopter scene makes Tony look like he doesn't know what he's doing. This new version presents a Tony who knows exactly what he's doing, but that isn't good enough. So Tony gets Maya and Pepper out of the mansion and meets Saban outside. But Tony's not alone. He activates a couple of the 35 suits he has made in the year or two since the Battle of New York. We'll use some of the fun-looking ones. Hot Rod and Red Snapper land on either side of Saban, and Heartbreaker lands beside Tony. Tony and Saban exchange some dialogue. Tony's upset that the Mandarin didn't come himself. Saban says that he's just the messenger here to tell Tony on behalf of the Mandarin that, quote, your suits won't save you anymore. The central question of this movie is, can Tony be Iron Man without the suits? And then, what does that even mean? So it makes sense for Saban himself to introduce the idea that the extremist soldiers are a new kind of threat, a problem that Tony is going to have to solve in a new way. Tony's still Tony, though, so he tries to intimidate Saban, says you should probably just quit, insert quippy pop culture name that Tony gives Saban based on his appearance. It's three versus one, you're outnumbered. Now this demonstrates two things. It shows us that Tony's still kind of an arrogant dick. He doesn't think that the Mandarin could possibly imagine that he made a bunch of new suits, and Tony has foiled this attack with his superior planning. And two, this continues the theme that Tony's hiding behind the armor. Sure, he's physically present, but he doesn't see himself as part of the fight. Tony's not Iron Man in this moment. The suits are. And once Saban has delivered his message, he begins to heat up. Eyes turn red, glowing skin, clothes are smoking. Tony realizes that something is off and tells Jarvis to take Saban down. Tony runs back inside and the suits spring into action. So the fight that's about to start is now an opportunity to do a couple things. The first is show off what the different suits can do. Because it blows my mind that the first two Iron Man movies and Avengers contain a total of seven 
Iron Man suits, and they're all pretty memorable. But Iron Man 3 chooses to introduce 35 new suits, and we spend virtually no time with them before they're all either destroyed by extremist soldiers or Tony himself. I mean, there are concept artists and designers and animators who worked for years on this stuff, and their creations were on screen for about a minute apiece, if they were lucky. Why not use the mansion destruction scene as an opportunity to show some of these suits off? I mean, Disney should want this. Kids aren't going to buy action figures of suits that were barely in the movie. I mean, they probably will, but they will buy a lot more of them if the kids leave the theater arguing over whether Tiger was cooler than Disco or whatever. So the fight starts and the suits go in one at a time, John claude Van Damme movie style. Red Snapper jumps in with a punch, but Saban catches its arm in midair and rips it off, like ripping a cardboard box in half. He smiles. You see, Iron Man 3 draws inspiration from a handful of Iron Man comics, chief among them being a series called Extremis. And if you've never read the Extremis comic or seen the motion comic, it's an Iron Man story written by Warren Ellis from the mid-2000s. Extremis is a reimagining of the Iron Man origin framed around Tony's struggle to fight a superpowered killer who outmatches Tony's Iron Man suit in nearly every way. In this comic, Tony beats the killer, a domestic terrorist named Malin, by using the Extremis virus to inject a nano version of the Iron Man suit into his bones, making the suit a physical part of him. Interestingly, Iron Man 3 ends the opposite way, with Tony destroying the suits and getting rid of the battery in his heart, proving that he is Iron Man without the suits. But the most important difference between the comic and the movie, in my mind, is that the conflict of the comic is just Tony vs. Malin. There are no other extremist soldiers. Tony finds Malin, fights him, gets destroyed, and then upgrades his suit so that he's able to beat Malin. We never get that kind of moment in Iron Man 3. One extremist soldier versus one Iron Man. The only extremist related fights in the movie are one extremist soldier versus an unarmed Tony, and then 20 or so extremist soldiers versus 35 Iron Man. The extremist soldiers are interesting because they can go toe-to-toe with an Iron Man suit and win easily. We need to see that fight first. So let's give Saban that moment now. He powers up and rips Red Snapper and Hot Rod to shreds, each one defeated by a different extremist power. Strength and speed, the suits don't even stand a chance. By going through the powers one at a time, we get a good intro into what the extremist soldiers can do. That way, once things really start moving in the Tennessee fight and the big finale, we know why they're so dangerous. This makes the action a lot easier to follow by clearly defining the stakes. And once Saban is through with Snapper and Hot Rod, he tosses Heartbreaker through the front door, heats up his forearm, chops Heartbreaker in half, and continues chasing Tony, who's now in his lab. Shotgun comes next and engages Saban in the lab. It's clearly the fastest suit so far, which means it's able to dodge Saban's punches, but eventually, Saban catches Shotgun's fist and breaks its arm off. Then he uses Fire Breath to melt Shotgun. Tony watches this and laments, oh, come on. And Tony's running out of suits. We aren't going to use all 35 new suits, but the five coolest looking ones deserve a moment. Jarvis says only a few are powered up so that we can keep this number relatively low and not overdo it. Jervis can also let Tony know that Pepper and Maya are out of the mansion. Once in the lab, we realize that Tony isn't just running, though. He's looking for something. He's trying to use the Mark 42, aka the Prodigal Son, to escape. He just needs to make his way to the garage and finish injecting himself with those weird sensors so the suit can find him. But Saban's still on his tail. Tony makes it into the garage, and just as Saban's about to catch Tony, the last available suit, Shade, catches Saban. This time, things go better for Tony. Shade's the heat resistant suit, which means Saban can't burn through it. Shade's able to overpower Saban and pin him to the ground while Tony makes his way to the injector. Just as Tony is about to finish shooting the sensors into his arm, the ground begins to give beneath them. Tony hasn't noticed this up until now, but the fight has caused a ton of structural damage, especially Saban's fire breath, and the foundation of the house is crumbling. So Tony drops the injector and it slides across the room. At the same time, Saban is able to use the shaking as an opportunity to get free and pin Shade against the wall using whatever the new Audi for 2013 is before hurling a motorcycle at Shade, destroying the suit. Now, Tony's scrambling towards the injector, but the ground is quaking beneath him, and that makes it difficult. And right as Tony is about to grab it, Saban lunges between Tony and the injector and knocks Tony to the ground. Now, Tony's out of options. The mansion's collapsing. Saban's standing over him. He can't summon the Mark 42. Saban draws a breath. You can see his lungs glowing underneath his skin. And right as he is about to burn Tony to death, a fire extinguisher goes off covering Saban, cooling his lungs, and temporarily disabling him. Tony turns, and who does he see but Dummy, the fire-extinguishing robot? Standing ovation. Dummy gives Tony a wave, and Tony tells Dummy that it doesn't need to wear the hat anymore. This moment gives Tony the break he needs to inject the last sensor in his arm and summon the prodigal sun armor to escape the falling house in the nick of time. We won't see Saban escape, but he's still got all the speed and strength, so he can definitely get out of there. We'll see him later in the movie. And yeah, right now, Dummy will get destroyed, and that'll be a really sad moment, but like 
like in the end of the regular Iron Man 3, Tony will drudge him out of the waters and bring him back to life, you would assume, for a future movie. Besides the opportunity to show off the other suits and demonstrate what makes the extremist soldiers different from every other MCU villain up until this point, this new mansion attack does something really important. It takes everything Tony's been working on and throws it all away, knocks him back to square one. Iron Man 3 is a deconstruction of Tony Stark, so the first big incident he has to deal with should challenge who Tony thinks he is. The helicopter attack is pointless. Tony is just surprised when a couple of helicopters show up and shoot his mansion. Who cares? They don't mean anything. They aren't special helicopters. They're only able to destroy the mansion because of things going wrong for Tony. He's caught off guard. The suit doesn't work. That's not interesting. What's interesting is the idea that when Saban arrives at the mansion, everything plays out according to Tony's plans. The suits all show up and do what they're supposed to. Tony doesn't lose because of a malfunction or bad luck. Tony loses because his assumptions about how the world works are wrong. And that is a much better place from which to start a journey. But that's just my opinion. Let me know in the comments if you agree, if you disagree. Like and share this video with friends of yours who like Marvel movies and hate helicopters. I'm starting a new podcast soon, but I don't know what it's called or what to look out for. So just, I guess, keep that in the back of your mind. I made a Patreon after my last video, which was awesome. I'm really thankful to everybody that donated. If you feel so inclined, throw in a buck or two. You'll get access to these videos before everybody else and eventually other stuff too. And most importantly, subscribe to my channel. I make more of these videos. I've got a video on how a different setting would have made Suicide Squad a way more effective movie, and I've got a video on how I believe Bizarro would have been a more interesting villain in Batman v Superman than Doomsday. Finally, follow me on Facebook and Twitter for more updates on videos and podcasts and all that stuff. I am at Nando v Movies. That's all I've got. I'll see you next time.